All right, this lesson is about disease transmission. We are sort of covering over um, or re reviewing modes of disease transmission, but we are also talking about three new dot points here. Okay, disease transmission in spread. When we're talking about disease transmission in spread, we're really talking about the pathogen spreading. And we know that there are so many methods of, of spread, including direct contact, person to person, droplets, airborne, all those types of things. Now, all of these are complicated by a num the number sorry, and the types of people that are being infected. And transmission tracking is incredibly complex and layered because it's affected by so many different things. Now, factors that influence disease spread can be related to so many things like population density, uh, population movement, where and how and how often they're traveling, um, personal and community hygiene, uh, whether those facilities are even available, uh, immunity levels in the community, who's getting vaccinated, environmental factors, where they're living, whether all those types of things, the mode of transmission of the particular pathogen and what type of pathogen it is. Now, transmission and spread is incredibly complex and layered, okay, and it can be broken down into different categories and sorted, but just know that all these things are generally integrated and all of those things there have an effect on any particular pathogen. Right, the ability of pathogens to infect, so their virulence, is it's ever-changing, it evolves, and, and as human conditions are also evolving, these types of things are hard to predict, right? When talking human conditions like housing, uh, hygiene awareness, hygiene practices, their movement, all those types of things. So uh, if we look at, say, influenza, we know that it is genetically changing uh, throughout our time, and so we need to keep updating what we do, for example, vaccinating. Now, living organisms are the best types of spreaders. We're, we're, you know, we're vectors essentially, but for one another. We love to travel and, and this leads to obviously uh, trans increased transmission. Now, for transmission, uh, living pathogens must be able to stay alive between hosts and they must be able to infect a new organism to reproduce and live. We understand that. But also, you know, between in this kind of section here, we need those, the organism needs to stay alive so it can get to a new host. Weirdly, though, if they reproduce too much inside that host and they cause too much pathology, too much tissue damage, the host will actually die and then that leaves the pathogen homeless. So they have to kind of hustle to find a new host. Now, non-living pathogens, they can last for much longer outside of the host, but they need the host to survive and reproduce. So they can't, you know, kill them off too much. All right, let's talk methods of transmission. We have direct, which is person to person or droplets. We have indirect, which is airborne, contaminated objects, food and water, animal to person or environmental or factors, sorry, and vectors. We've seen these before. This is just a recap. All right, let's talk direct contact we require physical contact between an infected person and a susceptible person we're talking touching kissing sexual contact uh, contact with you know saliva whatever it is body lesions open wounds um, and these kinds of pathogens are generally unable to survive for long periods of time without a host if we're talking indirect contact is very similar however the um, we're talking an infected surface or contaminated surface needs to be touched so frequent touch surfaces phones uh, door handles benches toilet flush buttons whatever some organisms are capable of surviving on surfaces uh, for extended periods of time and there's some discussion about whether COVID-19 can as well Right, droplet contact occurs when infected droplets make contact with your eyes, nose and mouth. So while we're discussing, you know, do we need to wear a mask? Some discussion is also around, do we need to wear safety goggles or, or glasses or something like that? Now, these droplets are obviously water and they settle very quickly as they're quite large. So measles is an example of this one. All right, airborne transmission is similar to droplet contact, but these are tiny, tiny particles that are suspended in the air. So they can last in the air where we breathe for a lot longer. They don't sink or drop like those droplets. Um, and these organisms can then, can then enter the respiratory tract. And an example of that is chickenpox. Okay, fecal oral transmission, we're talking about organisms that infect the digestive system and they usually enter our body through contaminated water or food um, and they multiply in the intestines. So it's generally in areas where sewage enters the water supplies and, you know, you're downstream from that. And these are very, very concerning in developing nations. All right, vector-borne transmission vectors are animals capable of transmitting disease, fleas, mites, ticks, rats, dogs, whatever it is. Okay, so, um, so the organism themselves might actually be the pathogen or the uh, vector might actually just be carrying the pathogen. Um, and this is adding an extra dimension because these can travel really large distances. 
All right, when we're talking about regional and global spread, we're going to talk about clusters. And clusters are these small outbreaks of disease, and they appear in local regions. So you might, you know, hear the news talking about hotspots. Um, clusters can be affected by so many different things. You know, we're talking weather conditions like temperature, humidity, the you know amount of rainfall. We're talking airflow and ventilation in where you might be. So if you're locked into a big, you know, seven story building with just air conditioning and no open windows, that might cause um, you to be in part of a cluster. Talking hygiene practices and behavior in general, um, you know, is your transport system um, going to take into consideration all these things and what your social networks look like? Who are you in interacting with? And in Melbourne, you might have seen, you know, some of these um, suburbs being considered hotspots and whether the social networks and transport systems in them have had an effect. Now, we understand global spread has obviously increased, um, you know, all this transmission and it has increased risks due to our airline travel and that's speeding up transmission. It's increasing the distance those transmission um, can, you know, can reach and the numbers of disease carriers are spreading the pathogen to new regions, basically. And increased global travel also leads to an increase you know, increase in contact with, say, foreign flora and fauna. And I'm not saying, you know, we're taking koalas overseas. I'm saying we are taking new diseases overseas. So that's about it for this point. There is a second video, so we'll go through that in a moment.